Now, I know, I know for a lot of Catholic viewers and listeners, uh, just in my, based on my years of experience in the classroom, that when Catholics hear the word predestination these days, a lot of them thinks, think, oh, well, wait, predestination is something that other Christians believe, like Calvinists in particular, okay? Because John Calvin, one of the Protestant reformers, was very famous for his doctrine of what's called double predestination, namely that God foreordains, irrespective of human will, some people to go to heaven and some people to go to hell, irrespective of their decision for or against them or their choice to accept or reject his grace. Um, and so many Catholics kind of are, uh, I don't know, I'm going to say repulsed, but that, that's, that's a fairly strong word. Like they're, they are repulsed by the idea of predestination because they think of it primarily in a Calvinistic mode, idea of a double predestination, where God foreordains for people to be damned irrespective of their response to grace. Although it's true that Calvin made that view of, of predestination very famous and widespread, it is not, in fact, a biblical doctrine of predestination. It's a misinterpretation of the biblical teaching of predestination. But we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? The reason the Catholic Church teaches and affirms predestination, this is important, is because the Bible teaches and affirms predestination, and not just the Bible in general, but Paul in particular, Romans 8, is the locus classicus, the kind of classic place where Scripture explicitly affirms the idea that God decides in advance, right? He predestined the elect, the chosen, to be conformed to the image of his son, that Christ might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay, as soon as I say that, you might be thinking, well, hold on. What about the whole issue of free will? And of course, free will is also a biblical teaching that the Catholic Church affirms. I'll just give you one passage if you want to look this up. This isn't from Paul, but it's from a book that we can make a really strong case that Paul was familiar with, and that's the book of Sirach. Um, there are several allusions to and very close parallels between Paul's writings and the book of Sirach, which is only in the Catholic Old Testament, by the way, but it's still an important writing even for non-Catholic Christians. So Sirach chapter 15, verse 14, it says, God created man in the beginning, and he left him in the power of his own inclination. If you will, you can keep the commandments, and to act faithfully is a matter of your own choice. So Sirach's very clear that God makes man free, right? He has in the power of his own inclination, and if he chooses, he can keep the, the commandments through his own free choice. So what we have in Scripture is a tension between the doc doctrine of God's divine foreknowledge and providence, his predestination, his foreordaining everything that's going to happen, and the affirmation of the truly free will of each human person. And those, those, that tension between those two is just part of biblical revelation. Both truths are affirmed by Scripture and would have been affirmed by Paul. In fact, um, I don't have the quote with me off the top of my head, but it's a, there's a quotation in the Mishnah. It's a saying of the rabbis. And remember, Paul is a member of the Pharisees, so he's, he grows up as a Pharisee and he learns the doctrines of the Pharisees. And one of the sayings of the rabbis in the Mishnah, I'm paraphrasing, but basically it says, you know, all things are foreordained and free will is given. Okay, so, so do you believe in providence or do you believe in free will? Do you believe in predestination or free will? And the Pharisee would say, all things are foreordained and free will is given. Well, how do you reconcile that? And they would say, all things are foreordained and free will is given. In other words, there's an affirmation of the two because both are affirmed by Scripture, even though obviously it's, it's a mystery as to how exactly they correspond. And we'll see what the church says about that in the catechism in just a minute. But for now, I'm just giving you the context for Paul's statements here. So it's not unsurprising that Paul, as a former Pharisee, would speak about predestination, about God not only knowing what's going to happen in advance, but also in some real sense determining what's going to happen in advance, having the whole map of human history planned and plotted, the whole drama of salvation from the very beginning to the very end is already not only known to God, but determined by God, that he, he's like an author who writes the story. And as we'll see in a second, the catechism is going to say, and he writes into that story the free agency of every human being. That's how powerful he is. He can both determine everything that's going to happen and include in it the free choice of every human being. So it's both and, not an either or, it's both and, both are true.
Anyway, case. Okay. Uh, kind of getting into the weeds here with that. But I just wanted you to be a little familiar about the background of Paul's statements here when he talks about predestination. That's a pretty standard Pharisaic doctrine, which, by the way, um, is different than other Jewish sects in the first century AD. So there were other groups like the Essenes or the Sadducees that would not have agreed with the Pharisaic understanding of free will and, and predestination. Some groups would have been more deterministic. In other words, God decides everything and we don't have freedom. All right, so that might be a one view you would, you would find on the ground there. In any case, okay, so Paul here is affirming, number one, divine foreknowledge, number two, predestination, and then number three, well, what's the object of predestination? What is he talking about? What does that mean? What does God foreordain? What does he predetermine? In this case, it's salvation. So he says, he predestined those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. So notice there's a string of verbs there that Paul's using. First, predestination, God's decision from all eternity, his choosing in advance, right, making a determination in advance. Second, vocation. Then God calls those whom he foreknew, right? This is, uh, kaleo is the Greek word for to call. We get the language of vocation from that. So what's my vocation? Well, in this case, he, Paul's talking about the vocation of salvation. So predestination, vocation, those whom he called, he also justify. There's your third verb, justification, which we could do like multiple videos on this. Um, there's a huge debate about this going back to the Protestant Reformation, at least actually goes back even further than that. It goes back to origin, but that's a whole other story. Um, Justification can mean both to declare righteous, like in a courtroom, a person is declared, vindicated, righteous, but it can also mean to make righteous. Okay? Um, I'll leave open for just a minute what that is, but in this case, Paul's doctrine of justification. Those who believe in Christ are justified by faith, apart from works of the law. And then the final verb, those whom he justified, he also glorified. Glorification for Paul. He tends to use this term to speak about the resurrection of the dead, right? So that's when we will share in the glory of Christ. So what Paul's doing here is he's going all the way from predestination, which would be at the beginning or even before the beginning of time, to glorification, which would be at the end of time. He's kind of stringing together the whole story of salvation. Those whom he predestined, he calls to faith and baptism. Those whom he calls, he justifies in baptism and faith, right? That's when he makes us righteous. He gives us the gift of salvation. And then those whom he justify, he also will glorify at the resurrection of the dead. All right, so that's how this is all stringing together. Now, if you go back for a second to Paul's statement about being conformed to the image of the Son, this is a really crucial statement on Paul's part. Um, and I don't want it to be overshadowed by the fascinating topic of predestination and free will. The point of predestination for Paul is that those whom God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. And the Greek word here is sum morphos. Sum means with, right? And morphos, like we, we, we um, speak about morphology in English, although maybe not everybody speaks about that so much anymore. But metamorphosis, right, is to be changed. And that's what Paul's describing. To be changed into the image of his Son. And the Greek word there for image Icona, we get the word icon. Okay. So here you see where Paul's describing what is salvation about, according to Paul? What is justification about? What is predestination about? What's it all aiming toward? It's not just about being declared innocent or forgiven by God, right? Um, there was a famous line in Luther's theology of salvation, simul justus et peccator, at the same time righteous and a sinner, okay? And there's a debate about how to interpret that, like there is about everything, but many Christians will take that and, and have taken that as a kind of shorthand way of describing the fact that when we are justified by faith, God declares us to be righteous, 
but he doesn't actually make us righteous. We remain wicked. We remain sinners. We remain in sin. But the innocence and righteousness of Christ, in a sense, is extrinsic to us. It covers us, but it doesn't actually change us from within. All right? Um, and, and that phrase, at the same time, righteous and sinner, means we've been declared righteous, but we're not actually righteous. We're still sinners interiorly, kind of just exteriorly being covered with the righteousness of Jesus. Um, that's not how Paul's describing justification in Romans 8. Because here, in the very context of talking about being justified, he also talks about being sumorphos, being conformed to the likeness of Christ. Paul doesn't believe in just declaration, although he does think that we are declared righteous. He also believes in transformation, a real change taking place in the person who has faith and who has been baptized through the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within the believer, right? So there's an interior change because of the gift of the Holy Spirit that really makes a person not just righteous, but also into a saint, hagios, a holy one, like Paul will describe throughout his letters when he refers to believers as saints. So that the the believer becomes a little icon of Jesus, right? Who, in a sense, it's as Paul, well, not in a sense, as Paul himself says in Galatians, it is no longer I who live, right? But Christ who lives in me. Right? And that's a real life. Of, that's what predestination is all about. In fact, maybe I'll give this, I'll give you this quote in just a minute. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is really clear that God predestines no one to hell, but he does predestine to salvation. Like this is his plan. That's his plan of foreknowledge is to give the graces that are necessary for us to be conformed to the image of the Son. And that's what Paul's getting at here. So there's a real change that takes place, according, at least according to Romans, which is Paul's classic statement um, about the nature of salvation and the good news of salvation. So this is a very, very crucial verse. In fact, if you want to dig into this a little bit more, um, I co-authored a book with Michael Barber and John Kincaid, two good friends and colleagues of mine, called Paul, a New Covenant Jew. And in a chapter of that book, we have a whole chapter on justification, which I think the subtitle of the chapter is Conform to the Image of the Son. And it's all about the real transforming power of justification according to the theology of Paul. And John Kincaid, one of the authors of the book, coined a phrase that's very helpful. He talks about cardiac righteousness. In other words, that the righteousness of those who are believers in Christ is not just um, uh, extrinsic, it's not just something external, it's actually interior, because God, through the Holy Spirit, changes the heart, the cardia, right? There's an indwelling righteousness that's part, in fact, that's part of the essence of what salvation is all about in the new covenant. That God takes out our hearts of stone, as Ezekiel said, and gives us hearts of flesh, right? He puts a new spirit to dwell within the believer so that the believer can freely keep the commandments with the assistance of God's grace and the grace of the Holy Spirit.